Good evening, good evening, and welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm very pleased and honored to welcome to the program Mr. Lewis Neiser, one of our distinguished men of the law, as it were, and philosophers within the American society, if I may say so. And it's a great pleasure indeed, Mr. Neiser, to welcome you to Conversations. Thank you, sir. We do want to talk about the law, the <coughs> historical development of it, some questions of current challenge within the jurisdictional arrangements of our, of our society and so forth, and also some questions of politics. But I wonder if maybe I could ask you a lead-in question, if I could. We live at a time, we were just chatting before we began the interview now, at a time of incredible change and transformation, technological capability evolving ever more rapidly, and a, a time of great challenge as we look ahead. Are you, uh, at this time, in a general philosophical sense, uh, generally optimistic concerning the human prospect, uh, given all the challenges and so forth that do exist? But I wonder if maybe a general overview of how you're, philosophically, how you view the human condition at the contemporary I'm time. very optimistic, uh -huh. and the reason is that I can't possibly imagine that the destiny of man is to destroy himself in the world. Mm. And also it is the only safe prediction. If it is destroyed, no one will be able to challenge this comment. Mm -hmm. But seriously, uh, I think just as generations after generation have fought their way through problems mm -hmm. from disease to poverty to war, that we will finally evolve into a more, a better society and a human society. Mm, that we may evolve into a, a better and a more human society in a, almost in a qualitative new way. I wonder if you feel we might be at a time of a qualitative transformation, yes. which perhaps might be the averse side of this destructive capability that is Prometheus-like in our hands now. Precisely, I think we're almost being compelled to adopt an ideology and a spiritual value because otherwise life is going to expire for everyone before natural death. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that can be the desire or will or the potentiality of the human race ultimately that it will destroy itself. I can't imagine it. It is, it is interesting, isn't it, in a certain sense that we sit and talk <coughs> now at a time when we do, perhaps for the first time, over a long sweep of human history and prehistory, as it were, we live at a time where that, that ability for us to, in a certain way, create a habitat incapable of support of the species is a reality and uh, does make it a particularly interesting and challenging time. Don't you agree? I time? fully agree. I think it, we are conscious now of the terminability of life just as cancer patients, when they become conscious of the terminal disease, adopt, I think, in many cases, a serene approach mm -hmm. away from the storms which they lived in when they were healthy. I think that we are being pushed into an ideological necessity for, for the preservation of life. Mm -hmm. There's a quote that we often have used here on Conversations, if I were, from James Joyce. He had Daedalus say at one point that history is a nightmare from which we're attempting to awaken. And I wonder if in a certain sense, if we look back through history in a certain context and with perhaps grasping some future potentialities, if the historical experience that has been the human experience could be seen in certain nightmare terms. There's been a great deal of suffering and so forth that's been characteristic of the, the development of human society. Some of it is very mysterious and yeah. challenging. For example, if you take the African continent on the map and fit it into the South American continent, you'll see that they match perfectly. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that at one time there was a prior nuclear uh, explosion which separated the world, mm. destroyed it, and then separated certain continents, or is it only due to plaques, which mm. some scientists say? Yeah. But it is possible, since we're dealing with six billion years. Yes, indeed. But yes, it is. We, we've been dealing, against such a long sweep in terms of the human, uh, well, the, the, the experience of life on Earth, as it were, and even proto-life, I mean, there was uh, a, a pattern of evolutionary development in this part of the universe that is exciting and, and interesting. So far as we know, this is the first time in modern history that due to biological, chemical, and nuclear potentials, it would be possible to destroy not only the whole human race, but every blade of grass and every insect. Mm -hmm. This is a potentiality that never existed before in our lifetime. Never. It's Promethean. It, it, it truly is in tr indeed mm -hmm. in Promethean that we've built this capability at, at our own hands. And I wonder if on the adverse side of that, if we do collectively as a society, uh, have the political wisdom and so forth to find our way through, 
if we cannot perhaps begin to grasp something like something that's been thought of as liberation or millennial view or an ability to provide life support and a way of life that uh, could only have been seen as millennial or future uh, throughout, in future terms throughout the human experience. That it could be exciting and liberating times in which we find ourselves. I think we'll be forced to hold hands or, or we'll find the hands hold knives we'll, of destruction. We're going, to be forced to, we're going to be forced to be successful whether we want to or be brought kicking and screaming into the... I think that's our destiny. I wonder if it's a birth metaphor. Is perhaps correct. We've been gestating throughout the human experience mm -hmm. and we're about to enter some new condition. And if that were the case, then we would be looking for forms, institutional forms, and, uh, and political forms and so forth that perhaps uh, give a, a grasp of uh, possibilities that have not been there or have eluded us throughout the human experience and uh, would make it ex extremely challenging. We have the institutional structure we've inherited from the past. We'd have to build on that. But the challenge to our institutional structures and how we might be able to transform them would be a major challenge of some of our, our best thinking that we can muster, don't you think? I think selfishness is a propulsion to why idealism uh -huh. That's interesting. And, and I think our selfishness to preserve the race in ourselves will make us more rational. Uh -huh. you, you, you feel that that's the case, that, uh, that, uh, that, that we'll see in our own terms, our own selfish interest will, will lead us to that. There mm -hmm. are difficulties as we look about politically, the bombs are continuing to be ba ba made, the, the same rhetoric of war and uh, among the nations is still beginning, mm -hmm. is still very much in the minds and lips of many of our political leadership and so forth and so it is a worrisome time in a certain sense in terms of the the fact that there is such this uh, tremendous capability and, and yet we have had in the large sense of the word the lo longest cessation of of warlessness in the very large sense of the word we have many cruel conflicts that we've had in many a generation just here in this recent yes 40 that, years that is true that is true there have been small we haven't had world conflagration right. and so forth, and we've been living under a... And we always stare away from it, even at the last moment of peril, because mm. we know it is too costly to win. Uh -huh. It would almost have to be through the most uh, irrational of miscalculations that this, could, uh, that this, could, that this, right. this sort of thing could appear. This, going to affect the, uh, this would affect, uh, you're, you're, a, you're a man who understands and has been involved with the law and the, the institutions of the law, and, and so forth, and uh, the legal structure, statutes, and notions of common law, and so forth, have served us throughout a uh, historical experience. And I wonder if uh, this period, philosophical discussion of the period, how this would affect the institutions of the law, and let's say the advocate, and the lawyer, and the people within the, 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 the legal profession, and so forth, and how we might be able to view these, these questions as it relates to men of the law. Well, as you know, the law is the embodiment of the attempt to have some rational rules of safety for all people and justice for all people. It comes down from um, biblical days. Uh, many of the precepts today are in the Bible and in the Talmud for the Jewish religion and the uh, uh, Japanese uh, and the Korean and so on and the Koran, they all deal with uh, the ethics of survival. And so the law really is the expression of some kind of control of the passions of human beings. And we do the best we can through the law to control those passions. Mm -hmm. And I think that this will contribute ultimately to a better world because it is now taking greater hold in all nations. The um, ruthlessness of uh, dictatorships is now bringing about protests all over the world, not only within the dictatorships, and that's a healthy sign. Mm -hmm. We do have many variety of, uh, of, of, of political philosophy, religious philosophy, spiritual philosophy, characteristic of the members of the various societies of the world. There are some varying views of what constitutes the good society among various peoples of the world. And it, 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 it's the differences that exist between the, uh, the, the, the notions of political, appropriate political uh, activity between the nations of the world that hopefully might be able to find in some confederated or federated notion of a, a commonality of a view. We have a United Nations that has a certain precept of basic principles, we have a declaration of human rights, certain kinds of principles that apply 
to the whole of the human society, but it's important that we begin to get some sort of commonality of understanding among the peoples of the world, do you think? And are we well, making we progress must, that way? I believe so, but we must do much more. Yes, sir. The United Nations due to its preservation of national sovereignty, overlooks the sovereignty of man. Everybody talks about the sovereignty of nations. Mm -hmm. What about the sovereignty of man and his existence and his preservation? It's an interesting parallel, if you've ever thought of it. The Articles of Confederation of the United States, originally when we were founded in 1776, we had all the same defects that the United Nations has today. It was only 13 years later, in 1787, when Hamilton called the, the various uh, representatives of the 13 states together by a ruse. Incidentally, they had refused to come previously. That's right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at that meeting, corrected the sovereignty insistence of each nation. Georgia had its own army, Connecticut had its own army, there was no Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Each had their own banking systems. Yes, mm -hmm. they taxed imports from state to state. Yes. New York taxed in wood coming across from Connecticut. And the, this country founded, very few people remember that, it founded and might have been the dis it might have been the destruction of the last possible hope on earth for a democratic government. Mm -hmm. And then in 1787, we corrected all those defects just as the United Nations ought to be corrected today. Yes, indeed. Yeah. We made a Supreme Court of the United States, and under the Articles of Confederation, states refused to submit themselves to, uh, to Congress for a decision. There was no Supreme Court of the United States. Mm -hmm. There was no federal judiciary. Yeah, it's amazing. Congress would have tried to do it, and many states said we won't submit to your justice today. They don't submit even to the world, to the world yeah, court. Yeah, and Georgia declared war on two Indian tribes and made peace mm -hmm. uh, without consulting the government. Yeah, yeah. Taxes couldn't be collected. To wonder that they were able to function at all in a certain sense, it, what do you think about it? It was about to collapse. Uh -huh. And I think that we ought to take that lesson to heart. The United Nations must be effective. There must be an international court that has power to enforce its edicts through an, an international army, not each country having its own army. I believe it or not, Jefferson said, I'm not going to submit my fate in this confederation to a foreigner from New York. <laughs> yeah, it's laughable now, but at the same time, and he actually meant and, that, that uh, had some meaning to those people yes, at that time. Yes, just yeah. as today, I'm not going to submit my fate of this nation to a voter to a nation who wants to vote from uh, Afghanistan or Russia. Or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have much to do. We, had a, we, we, we were blessed with an incredible array of fine political minds and so forth, the, the founding fathers. It was an amazing array of uh, talent. And we also were a nation of one language. There were some there was some cohesion there that yes. made it easier and the challenge is larger at the same mm. uh, now but the challenge and the the, meta, the, the challenge is, is is essentially that is to find some system of world government some system of uh, uh, of understanding that could make the united nations as it were in a certain take sense the voting. a federal <clears throat> expression take another just small point there was no two cameras for voting no two houses uh -huh. um, now we have House of Representatives, which is based on population, and two senators from every state, irrespective of population. Yeah. Now that sounds normal to us. Just think what would happen if we didn't have that in this country. And today, seven votes in South America representing 4% of the people of the United States could control a vote by the United States, uh -huh. could overcome it. The voting selection in the United Nations is wrong. Mm -hmm. And Churchill once suggested four standards for voting. One, education standards to be judged. Two, productivity. Um, three, population. They're entitled to some consideration. And four, industrial capacity. Mm -hmm. Now, a combination of those factors to determine the vote of each nation in the United Nations 
certainly would be better than what we have today, mm -hmm. in which one of the subsidiaries of Russia, Belor Russia, yeah. Belarus or something, yeah. has a vote and the United States has one vote. Yeah. Um, in the General Assembly. Afga yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan has a vote and we have one vote. And yeah. if you go past the General Assembly, each country has a veto. Uh -huh. And this wasn't the Soviet Union's fault. We, uh -huh. We've got to be fair about it. The United States insisted upon it. Uh -huh. Because otherwise we didn't join the League of Nations yes, because indeed. of Article 13, if you recall, which mm -hmm. gave up our sovereignty, as it was called. We're not going to submit ourselves to the foreigner from New York, well, the foreigner from South America. And therefore, if we were to apply this reform, we might make the United Nations, which really would preserve the peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the nation state has for some time been thought of as the basic political entity. Reinhold Niebuhr wrote uh, very eloquently on mm -hmm. the morality of nations and the immorality of the geopolitical reality among the nations of the world and mm -hmm. I guess we're trying to move mm -hmm. toward a uh, uh, certainly the the economy of the world is becoming increasingly interdependent telecommunications is increasingly right. knitting the world together mm -hmm. into less parochial kinds of views and this might augur well for that but the the notion of national sovereignty in the nation state unfortunately perhaps is still seen by most as the basic uh, uh, political allegiance to which most people lend themselves. What right? would happen to our national system if a judicial decision could be ignored? Say, uh, you've made that decision, Mr. Congress and the President of the United States, but we don't pay any attention to it. Mm -hmm. You can't send in an army to enforce your injunction. Mm -hmm. Now, internationally, that should be the situation, but it isn't. Five countries can veto any resolution and therefore it becomes ineffectual. Mm -hmm. So we have to reconstruct the international community. We have to reconstruct the international community and perhaps uh, what and, and utilize to good advantage uh, what has been built through the of United course. Nations mechanism itself yes, and perhaps yes. reform, is that the right That's term? That's right. The United Nations in order to, to move I've in set that. forth in, in a, uh, an address I made which has been published uh, the specific changes in the present United Nations. Now, when I first proposed this, it was much more doable than it is today because things have hardened even more with antagonisms mm -hmm. and refusing to submit our sovereignty to the opinion of some other country mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I wonder what it is that may leads nations and people to uh, solidify, as it were, it's an essentially an, an insecure attitude toward, let's say, the fellow members of the human society. The, the foreigner. The foreigner, the outsider. You would think that there would be progression in a natural sense toward increasingly it's hard to get there. being able to do that. It's a, it's a mark of insecurity on the part of the remember, peoples of the world or remember, the leaders of the world. Remember the song in, in uh, uh, Michener's play, South Pacific, mm -hmm. You've Got to Be Taught. Uh-huh. Yeah. To hate. Yeah. Ordinarily, there'd be no hate between people of different colors or language, but we are taught virtually. We are brought up with prejudice, which must be undone. I wonder what the root cause of that kind of uh, prejudice. Fear of a stranger. Fear, fear of anybody we think is a stranger. Uh huh. Uh huh. I once said in a in a talk uh, with respect to color difficulties the race prejudice mm -hmm. issue. Um, if you thought there's a superstition in China that man is baked in an oven mm -hmm. and the color of his skin depends upon the degree of baking. And isn't it foolish to hate each other because some are better done than others? If you look at it that way, race prejudice is ridiculous, but look at it in the practical world, it has an enormous impact. Mm. And the various political leaders of the nation, I mean, uh, the, the President of the United States and the people that have a responsibility for that, do swear allegiance to uphold the Constitution of the United States. They do have an obligation to act in the national interest uh, primarily. And it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult for us to see us moving beyond that to a less parochial view. And it is a little upsetting, isn't it, that those, 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 those national identifications and the fear of the, the ability to work in a larger scale more federated, less confederated kind of way, mm -hmm. seems to be hardening. That's disquieting in a, in a very real sense in terms of uh, 
if we look at the, the evolution of events in Yes. A, the little wars of hatred all over. Yeah. In, the, in Ireland, Protestants and Catholics, Libya, uh, right now in Paris, another bomb thrown today, I understand, because of the differences between the socialists and the parties that won. Uh -huh. uh, killing is a resolution of difference of opinion. This is the animalistic approach to life. One wonders, we were talking before, <coughs> if I may, I, uh, we were talking before about the fact that we're at a time where we have, apparently just in your and my lifetime in a certain sense, uh, we developed this Promethean capability for destroying the species and perhaps a good deal of life itself that hasn't been characteristic of the human condition. It was quieter times, we were protected in our own ignorance and lack of technological ability to do that kind of destruction in a certain sense, whether or not at a subconscious level perhaps uh, or at, a, at, a, at another, at a, at a level, the uh, uncertainty of that or the, 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 the fact that that is mm -hmm. part of the human condition now leads to a sense of, I don't know, paranoia is the right term, or fear of the foreigner, or the well, there's an to... Well, there's an assumption in what you say which I don't accept, yes, namely sir. that that we have turned worse mm. in our humanity. Uh, we merely use spears and arrows at one time to kill each other, and now we have more capacity to do so, and therefore the danger is greater. Uh -huh. But the sheer uh, animosity of man, belligerency, I think that's the word. The sheer belligerence of the human being is uh, the same as it was thousands of years ago. I have once observed that if you examine scientific achievement, we have more scientists today than in all the recorded history of man. Indeed. Mm -hmm. But if you examine our improvement in moral sense, have we made much improvement for the past centuries? We use different weapons, but have we made much improvement? We've just become more destructive uh, in a case. More able to, to, to make armies that are effective. So then it brings us back to certain kinds of questions and views of human nature, perhaps. Uh, uh, but then is not the human nature affected in a certain sense or allowed to... Uh, be affected in a certain sense by the by the by the milieu within which the the institutions and so forth and the, the change. I well, mean, is, is, is the human society inherently selfish? Are we inherently selfish? Are we inherently greedy? Are we inherently, inherently belligerent, belligerent? But it thing? isn't beyond correction. Mm -hmm. But um, I have suggested that you would have to have new education for adults, not for children merely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are reaching a time when there will be a four or five hour work week in many industries due to technology. Mm -hmm. um, at the present time, we spend $50 billion for entertainment and we're bored. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What will happen when we have 15 and 18 hours a day uh, to do something with our lives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of technology? We may, as some Freudian uh, psychiatrists have suggested start wars for excitement. It's for the excitement of it. But um, mm. I am hoping that we can do something else to adopt a new kind of education, not bricks and mortar merely, yeah. but an adult education of the values of life and of the enjoyments of life which are not necessarily tied up to the machine that you operate because that will take only a little time. We'll have all sorts of devices to shorten our labors, with the exception of those that are that have brain labor. Mm -hmm. They can continue if they wish, the so lawyer, the doctor, so on. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the laborer will have enormous time on his hands, and we must prepare for that. that, that that's a big question that we could address right there, in, 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 in a certain sense. If, uh, if, we, if we look throughout the human experience, or if we, if we look at the human condition now, or our society and world society, um, in terms of, let's say, uh, if people are unemployed or they're employed less since they, for 95% of the population, they really only have their labor power in order to justify income for life's purposes, so that translates out into a lower standard of living and so forth. We'd need some sort of an institutional arrangement so people who have an increased leisured life 
are not having that leisured life of poverty, but we'd have to have some sort of a way of a more affluent, leisured way of being, which would be the, 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 that would have been the dream of Aristotle, that we could have lived a civilized uh, life in certain to sense. To put it another way, Professor. Yes, sir. Um, the, um, the future uh, is not faced with the danger of atom bombs, nuclear bombs, or communism. It's faced with boredom. It's faced with the problems of leisure. Mm -hmm. And we must prepare in a different way for that kind of attack. I wonder if I might suggest that you, you sir, are uh, uh, our leading um, uh, representative of the legal community in a very real sense and have had a, 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 a very uh, active life, a very active professional life, but you've also associated yourself very clearly with the arts. You're a fine painter, you've created music and so forth. Do you think we might not be able to have a greater encouragement of uh, artistic expression among the members of the well, world society as mm. something because, uh, or other, other, other systems? It seems in a certain sense, given the fact that there are innumerably uh, beautiful things, handicraft, other kinds of things that people could be involved with, that people would be bored with having um, a leisured uh, status. And yet I understand what you're saying, but it, it, it seems in a certain sense Unfortunate, to put it mildly, that that would be a major problem, that they wouldn't know what to do with themselves if they were in a free well, state. Well, without accepting your personal compliment, mm -hmm. I believe that versatility should be the rule, not the exception. And there's something encouraging in that. If you tried, you're a professor of a certain subject, mm -hmm. or subjects, but if you tried, that same talent and capacity might make you a fine pianist, a sculptor, a historian, writing books on it, which you probably do anyhow. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, while the other occupations may not be up to the standard of quality of what you're doing now, and maybe they will, mm -hmm. but they will have a fair expression and reflection of your inner capacity. The trouble is that we don't attempt that. Uh -huh. Now, it's for that reason that I, uh, not being modest, yes. but believing in versatility, yeah. uh, I've written nine books, yes. I'm a lawyer, I paint, uh, and so on. Music? It's, yes, I've mm -hmm. written music, I'm a member of ASCAP. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But the reason that I don't uh, consider this vain to say this, Besides, I don't believe in modesty. It's just another form of conceit, <laughs> something more to be admired for. Uh, I'm not saying this with uh, false modesty. I mean it quite literally, that if you tried, as I have tried, uh, your life could be advanced in many directions with the same talent which you have now chosen, you, in a general sense, yes. have chosen for only one profession. And I have known people uh, 70 and 80 years old who take up the piano and become wonderful pianists. Marvelous. They should have done it 30 years before. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Now that exploitation of man's capacity for versatility is part of the solution for the day when we will be faced with boredom unless we can do something with ourselves uh -huh. besides spending eight hours at a machine. Yes, indeed. I wonder, do you think it is that we've been so long at the machine, particularly through the industrial process of it, it gets broken down into functions which are almost inherently uh, boring, turning nuts on an assembly line. People have had to be at the mill doing these kind of things. They had to be trained in order to be able to do things that they really didn't want to do in order to earn an income, so that we put so much value in institutions that train people to be outer directed, to take their direction from the bosses or from a wage system or something like that, that we have an educational problem of teaching people to be able to pull upon inner resources and perhaps be a little bit more inner and artistically directed, and that's a major mm -hmm. sociological challenge that yes. we have to free ourselves in a certain yes, sense. Yes, quite right. To develop all the capacities within us which lie dormant. Uh -huh. uh, it has been said that um, we only use 10% of our capacity, all of us. If we used 15, we would be bright. Mm -hmm. If we used 20, we'd be brilliant. Mm -hmm. If we used 25, we'd be a genius. Wouldn't it be marvelous if we all did? <laughs> Wouldn't it be a different kind of world if we did? It's quite literally true. Yeah. We once had a guest here who commented that a man might be 
40 in his prime in a certain sense and have a stroke uh, where certain parts of the brain is damaged in the stroke. And when they relearn the act of walking, which is a tremendous learning process, yes. they, they activate and touch into new parts of the brain that they have. They become motivated. So it is possible to use greater amounts of the brain than we have done no and doubt. to become more, in that sense, creative and so forth. And that would be a, a major challenge area that we all have. We need institutions in a certain sense that could be encouraging that sort of thing. I wonder um, if... Uh, if you're optimistic that we could. It's also just education and learning in and of itself could be given a great deal more of a... Uh, uh, things are inherently interesting. Physics, biology, history, all of the lessons, as it were, of, of reality are inherently in and of themselves interesting. It's a shame that more people couldn't be able to find the, the interest and the joy of just plain learning. Don't you, don't you think right. for their, its own sake rather than learning to get a job or to get some sort of advancement within the material but world. But even if so they forth. have a job, the self-assurance that they might be very good at something else just to fill out their lives, even if it wasn't monetarily successful. Uh -huh. And I have seen, well, you know, in, in the history of literature and art of all kinds, people who were least disposed to it turned out to have genius in that direction when they tried. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the businessman who becomes a great painter goes to the islands, Gauguin, mm, Gauguin yeah, uh -huh, and uh -huh. so on. Uh -huh, You'll uh -huh. find many people who start in one direction and wind up as great composers. Mm -hmm. Now, I say he doesn't even have to quit with composing. Mm -hmm. If he has that talent, maybe he would be marvelous in science in studying the, the new directions of science. Maybe he would be excellent in uh, sculpting, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in exhuming great uh, artifacts. Indeed. Who knows? Yes, right. If we could open some of these opportunities up in a way that... Not, that not we, lie fallow. But we have difficulty in that. Now, why do we have such difficulty in having a society that encourages that kind of a human psychology, as, as it were. What we do you mean? Be, we've been uh, accustomed and trained to the tradition that you become a fireman, a policeman, a lawyer, a doctor. I won't finish out the syllogism. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you, you, that's your profession. Uh -huh. But uh, the fireman may turn out to be a, a very capable painter, maybe not world famous, but he'll derive great pleasure from it and also give others uh -huh. pleasure. There have been many such contrasting skills. Uh -huh. We all have it in us to develop to some extent. We do all have it in us and certainly the young have it to a large measure, don't they? And mm -hmm. the degree that, so, so it would be at, the, at the, uh, the specializing demands of the economic order in a certain sense that have kept us in a certain sense captivated? If that's Our own right lack of confidence. I'm a tailor. That's my tradition. I make very good suits. That's yeah. the end of it, says the fellow. Uh -huh. It isn't the end of it at all. If he, if he has a talent for making good suits, Maybe he'd be a great architect and make large building suits. I wonder, do you think, if, you make, if he's a very good tailor, he makes very good suits, and then if he, if he does that, or a painter, and one wonders about just the art world, if then that item and that he creates enters into the commercial world and a material value is put on it and so forth, if it's, if it's the materialization of it itself, rather than people taking joy mm. just in the process of creating the work itself. Very often it too would much be material, materially, yes. Very often it would be materially... Uh, rewarding. But even if it isn't, if the it reward isn't, is much greater. The reward of the actual creative activity itself is what The joy it's of life, the fulfillment of life. Are you optimistic that we're going to be able to get to a society where that... I think that we'll have to. We're going to have to somehow do that. Because uh, I can see ahead, it won't take too long, when, as I say, we'll all be forced into areas of eight, 10, 12 hours a day, and maybe in a week, a six hour work week, four hour work week. You see that coming, a six hour work yes. week, as yes. little as that, because of the robotics and the other kinds of technological systems that can do. You can see it very clearly. You've seen some even motion pictures or on television, robots grit greeting you at the door, taking yeah. your hat and coat, asking you what drink you like, yeah, giving right. it to you. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Hey, we are not that far away. Uh -huh. we're, we're not that far away from a, what in a certain sense would be a liberated order in terms of that. And are we going to be able to live with the, the freedom do do? and the liberation? What do we do with the liberation? Order? And do we have institutions that would permit us to deal with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, our institutions historically, uh, just the notion of economics. The That's why I mentioned a new kind of educational system. Well, yes. Not merely for children, uh -huh. but a complete 
uh, refurbishing of the mind and spirit through a larger educational process, the uh -huh. enjoyment of reading, of learning, and then applying it, uh -huh. not merely being a student. And I think that application is very gratifying. Uh -huh. I wonder, do you think that in that process of adult education and, and, and just education in general, the new technology, we're here talking on television and there are possibilities of that, film, television, some of these other kinds of newer technologies could be put to better service in terms of providing intellectual stimulation and an understanding of some of these possibilities. Well, they do, they do today to uh -huh. some extent. I don't look down at television as a sort of corrupting entertainment medium, which some do. I think that it is in very large measure responsible for a kind of world view of events which, unaware that we may be of it, fashions us. Mm -hmm. The very fact that we see how people live in other countries, how they dress, how they talk, their achievements, mm -hmm. uh, is an education which I think we deride too much, don't appreciate enough. We don't appreciate that enough, and, and uh, somehow we, we do have this tendency, don't we, to think of television, or anything that comes off the television is somehow just entertaining because there's been so much of it has been that, uh, and yet at the same time there's a rich uh, experience and learning that could take place. Uh, like, like all media, it has its low points by virtue of the lowest common denominator appealing to masses. Mm -hmm. And I understand the economic necessity of that. You need a darn good uh, soap opera or comedy to get the largest audience. Yes, uh -huh. I must warn you that your program will not get those, that audience. Probably not. They would be <laughs> tuning into something else more than likely, but it might be able to get the interest of some people who are very but interested in it. But those who do see it, uh -huh. uh, not because of this particular program, may enjoy a head-to-head -head encounter on another plane than just making laughs. Yes, indeed. I would hope, and also that we have more channel capacity, more and more capacity to have mm -hmm. alternatives other than what traditionally and economically was necessarily there yeah. makes it's, it possible. It's like newspapers and good books. There are very bad books. That's one of the problems with the First Amendment uh, yes. approach, uh -huh. to, to go to the law for a minute. Yes, please. We. Um, we apply the First Amendment sometimes so radically, so extensively. For example, we apply it to fine newspapers. They have a right to criticize no matter what. Right, very good, that's part of liberty. But there are newspapers which are scandal sheets, yes. which are even uh, uh, blackmail sheets. If yeah. you don't advertise mm -hmm. in us, we'll tell what blonde you were mm -hmm. out with mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. The, everything is called the press, to which a printing press is, uh, uh, has uh, affinity with, yes. and it has affinity to everything. Yes. Consequently, if we apply the First Amendment as strongly to that press, which is, which is uh, contemptible, mm. uh, deals purely in gossip and fake gossip, yeah. Uh, we may give the First Amendment a bad name to some extent, and it doesn't deserve a bad name. It's mm. magnificent. Mm. Now, that kind of extremism goes to almost every phase of life, I find. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, for example, uh, we, must, we must protect society against the criminal, but we must be very careful of the criminal's rights. Correct. But when you get to the point which is now a subject of great concern, where the criminal's rights conflict too strongly with what has become an epidemic of crime, mm -hmm. then we ought to re-examine even those rights to refine them. And we do that all the time. I'm not proposing anything radical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, there was a time when a lawyer couldn't comment that the defendant, um, why didn't you take the stand? Why did you hide behind the Fifth Amendment? Uh -huh. Today, there are some states that, through various devices, permit the prosecutor to say, if he's so innocent, why didn't he take the stand and deny it? Mm -hmm. Now, that challenges the true First uh, Fifth Amendment uh, believers, and I'm one of them. But I can see why. Or take capital punishment. Yes. Uh, another good illustration. Uh, there's a human instinct not to take life, no matter how bad the criminal is. 
-hmm. But uh, there comes a time if the criminal involved kills the president or a public official or is incarcerated for life and therefore has nothing to lose if all you can do is threaten him for life imprisonment, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. so he can kill a god with impunity, then you make exceptions perhaps and say no, we, we may have capital punishment for a few classifications. It is that elasticity in the law which isn't always accepted or wise, but which must be considered in order to have a rule of law which is sufficiently balanced to protect your wife if she's walking in the street and she's mugged. Mm, that elasticity is well served in the common law concept, do you think? Oh, well, yes. Particularly so, right? Because Indeed it is. With precedent and that sort of thing. Today, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a drug addiction crime. There were supposed to be 200,000 drug addicts in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, when they are caught in crimes, they tell you that they steal eight to ten times a day mm -hmm. to get the hundred dollars for the drug shot. Mm -hmm. Therefore, your present crime wave is not the ordinary crime wave, the two-story man or the bank robber. Mm -hmm. That goes on, unfortunately, murder, all those things. Mm -hmm. The reason you can't walk at Fifth Avenue at daylight without the danger of somebody mugging you or grabbing a necklace from a woman's neck is that it's drug addiction crime. Well, a good deal of it is, certainly, yeah, right, you know. And I propose that the way to deal with this is to give drugs under government auspices, free under, with a psychiatrist present, um, to the drug addict. Yeah, right. And this at one stroke would wipe out the entire mob that gets $160 billion mm -hmm. out of drug addiction overnight. Yeah, They'd be out of business. Mm -hmm. Sure, why not? They would give it free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you'd stop the kind of crime that defends us so, that makes every store put a sheath of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. gates on its window, is the kind of drug addiction crime, and well, there is a special way of treating that. Indeed, that's an interesting, because you said the, 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 the dealing with crime or special situations as they move could be toward, let's say, in a certain sense, moving in a certain sense to protect ourselves against the criminal in certain kind of what might be seen by some as harsh measures and so forth, or it might be done through enlightened sociological and political change mm -hmm. that can recognize the situation. We had prohibition at one time in the society. We took away the prohibition of alcohol. Right. Some of the crime went away. We can be wise in moving toward us. The society might be I'm indicating up against the law. I very in much for it. Uh -huh. I've debated it on national television with some governors and their answer is, well, then you're committing the drug addict to permanent addiction because you're giving it to him free. Mm. Uh, the answer is I don't see him getting cured today. That's right. Yeah. And after all, you'll have a psychiatrist there. There might be a gradual withdrawal or something. But that is not my chief concern. Mm -hmm. Who do you favor in this balance? Your wife or daughter walking on the streets or the poor drug addict who is already condemned to addiction. Yeah, and we, also, and we also at some point want to just sort of leave a certain measure of the concern up to the individual themselves in a, in a certain sense, and if they choose to do that, uh, so they do, and they, it might be that we could allow these things to be available to them, and it might be that given that, they might not need that they have to do it so much. Mm -hmm. Also, if the society was less alienating, there might be less need for people to change their consciousness or get out of a consciousness they find so uncomfortable. A great deal might have to do with economic problems, economic ordering of things. We have a political system in our country. Uh, we have a Dow Jones industrial average now that has uh, flirted with 1,800. Uh, mergers and buyouts are going at, a, at, a, at a, a monumental clip. There are a great deal of people, particularly at the top and uh, so forth, and some of the general people are doing very, very well. At the same time, we have Mr. Moynihan, uh, Senator Moynihan from New York, pointing out that four out of 10 children in New York City live in what is now defined as official poverty. We have hunger and homelessness as a plague across <coughs> the country and so forth. So we have some real problems of economics uh, that might very well be at the root cause of uh, some of the people using drugs and some of the crime and so forth. Do you there think it's a major problem that we need some new economic policies, some new economic directions? And I wonder that within a political context, if let's say the Democratic Party, which has been in a certain sense uh, 
out of the limelight on the national level for quite some time now might do well to consider some new economic policy directions. Well, before or, uh, giving some judgment, uh, personal judgment on that, let me uh, talk for a second about your first proposition. Yes, sir. It has been said that society prepares the crime due to poverty and terrible conditions, and the criminal only commits it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you had the plan that I propose, um, you would solve that problem because you wouldn't have to wait 20 years for educating the poor, uh, ignorant people, and you wouldn't have to um, put in 10 times more police and systems. Uh, you would eliminate the drug addiction crime overnight virtually. That's one of the virtues. But now on your second question. They would still be in poverty even if they didn't have drugs. That's right. And the problem of poverty and the problems of inequity and the problems of economics in the society. Well, my view about your second question, the Democratic Party and its lower state and what it can do to refurbish itself. Or what the nation can do, what some policy directions might yes. be. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I have some views about it. I don't know how sound they are. I reject the theory that the reason for the Democratic Party's decline is the popularity of the president, Reagan. He is popular, but okay. He's very popular, but that is not the reason because all you have to do is look at the whole world. Conservatism has been moving into power all over the world. Reactionism in many places, but yes sir. At least conservatism. Mm -hmm. In Canada, Trudeau was replaced by the present conservative. Trudeau was a liberal. In Germany, Brandt was replaced by Kohl, a conservative. Mm -hmm. In England, we have, of course, Mrs. Thatcher, a conservative as against the Labour Party. France recently? France, Mitterrand, a socialist, has been turning to capitalism, and that did him no good. It mm -hmm. still went uh, for the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. What is that Is you? Israel, Perez mm -hmm. is the conservative as against certainly Begin. Mm -hmm. It tells me that the people all over the world are rejecting extreme governmental paternalism. The theory that you can just pour money and create a bureaucracy for every group that has a grievance just doesn't work. When Franklin Roosevelt did it, and he was the progenitor of that theory, Here. Mm -hmm. there was a desperate need for it. Uh, we didn't even have money, American money. We had scrip. He closed the banks. Mm -hmm. People were selling apples just to live. In those days, extreme government paternalism was admirable. He saved the democracy by it. He organized all sorts of programs just to give people money, clean the parks, clean the museums. Artists paint something, we'll pay you money. Every group money poured into them to if, save the republic. If the private sector forces and economic forces were not going to serve, then we the government were. had to intervene in the name of the public good. Public good. Yes. And that was good. But yeah. then the Democratic Party thought this was a great formula. And so it continued that tradition. And it worked for quite a number of years until the people felt this was not a practical solution. Uh, look at the farmers. We've given more subsidies to farmers than uh, any other group, probably, and look at their desperate strait. Now, I'm not saying, therefore, that the Democratic Party cannot be revived or that the Republican Party is right. I happen to be a Democrat. Mm -hmm. I think what this tells us, in my judgment, is that the extreme liberal wing of the Democratic Party must recognize this worldwide movement towards a policy which depends on some kind of economic justification and strength instead of the trickling down theory, that's true, but that just pouring money into every sector and putting people permanently on the dole in every sector is noble and good-hearted, but it doesn't work. It's not effective. No, we, have a, we talked before about robotics and technology being yeah. increasingly responsible mm -hmm. for production. Yes. The technology in our economy is more or less effectively owned by only 5% of our population. 95% mm -hmm. of your population really have no ownership 
of technology well, and no claim to income by a viable portfolio or anything? Yet Do you think you we could expand ownership into the general yes, societies and instrument yes. of income distribution? It's one thing that is happening and mm -hmm. furthermore you have another good illustration. The unions have certainly declined in their political power. Certainly have. You Bargaining down. Yeah. You remember when the union's endorsement was an enormous advantage to a candidate. Today some of them fight not to get it. Indeed. Yeah. Now the reason for that change is not that the human requirement of being helpful to the downtrodden and the poor isn't still valid. The question is, can you just do it if you were a senator or a congressman and somebody said, there are so many uh, babies who are diseased and the hospital hasn't got enough room, shall we vote mm -hmm. uh, $200 million for more hospital for babies? Uh, how could you as a senator or congressman refuse that? Yeah. You're a decent man aside from the political motivation. Yeah. But we have learned that that is not the way to achieve it. That for every program you build up a huge bureaucracy. Therefore, it seems to me that the Democratic Party, I do not come to the conclusion that therefore conservatism and government is the right policy either. Forevermore or something, yeah, fine. Okay. But I come to the conclusion yes, myself mm -hmm that the reason that Ted Kennedy cannot run is that he represents that same old tradition, not on account of Chapter Twittish in my judgment, but yes. because he is the spokesman for the extreme liberal wing of the party. And that no longer can get votes. Therefore, if the Democratic Party would recognize that if it adopts the humane policy of concern for the average person and not serve just the wealthy, but doesn't, on the other hand, think it can achieve that by paternalism that is unbounded and unending, that it will restore its position of power. If it continues to think that the way to get votes is the way it used to for 30, 40 years after Roosevelt, just say you're for every poor child and, and uh, under the poverty line, etc., etc., it won't work. It doesn't work any place in the world today. But how are we going to, let's say then in a certain sense, if, uh, if we do have this, this question of the, the government has intervened, they tax the productive sector, we've had a tremendous amount of transfer payments to develop, Social Security itself, the concept of it is the intervention. The, 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 the common people have some political power. Yes. I mean, we have a political democracy. We have very much of an economic plutocracy. They have uh, ownership being of the means of production being so narrowly held. Uh, if, they, if, if, we're, if we're not going to have the intervention of that political process in order to, in some sort of sense, get income distributed throughout the society, how are we going to have income distributed to the, the people uh, in, in some manner so that there could be some equity and we're not having four out of ten children living in poverty evermore? I mean, well, how do we go hmm, about well, achieving uh, this if the government isn't going to intervene and use the little bit of political power that the common people do have. The government should and does intervene, and I think even the conservatives agree with that. The question is the degree of intervention and uh -huh. to what effect, what effectiveness it has. Take, for example, the tax laws. Mm -hmm. There's another illustration. The tax laws were originally designed just to raise revenues. No longer so. The tax laws are an instrumentality for economic adjustment. Mm -hmm. Illustration, uh, we want to uh, encourage people to dig for oil so we don't have to depend on foreign depletion. Mm -hmm. yeah. so therefore, we give a depletion allowance, which practically means that you're tempted. If you invest $10,000 in this oil well, even if you lose it, mm -hmm. you'll get back 9000 mm -hmm. So you take a chance on a dry hole, and there are plenty of dry holes, but yeah. it creates oil. Mm -hmm. This is much broader than one thinks. It isn't only in oil. Take the investment tax credit. If you're a businessman and you build another factory, on the theory we want to encourage that to give employment, mm -hmm. it isn't just a loophole. Mm -hmm. You build another factory, you get an enormous tax investment credit. Right. Okay. It writes off 80%, uh, 90%, Lord knows what. And uh, if you want to give charity, we want to encourage you to give charity. So the tax law doesn't just talk about raising monies. It says if you give a certain amount, uh -huh. 
and you pay it in cash within a certain period, we'll give you a large deduction okay. for your generosity. All right, fine. And then that, and that, that can be used. These tax laws and the structure we've inherited can be used to, in a certain sense, to st uh, stimulate the economy in certain ways that can build equity and... There's and, and an illustration. Now, when they go too far, you create loopholes. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you're going to give tax investment credits to large corporations to build more factories and take chances, mm -hmm. You can't just call it a loophole when they pay a little tax, or sometimes no tax. No, You've sir. created it yourself. Well, there's, there's, a, there's many dimensions to this, and certainly this is something that's going to be coming up because we're coming up to a presidential election, and these questions are going to be coming up. There is some increased uh, expansion of ownership into the employees, which is uh, perhaps being able to be encouraged through these things. But there's, a, there's an incentive for us uh, to think in terms of these new possibilities that there are as we come up to this presidential yeah. election. We could talk a great deal about them. There's going to be a great deal of discussion of these issues as we come up to the presidential election. Unfortunately, even in cable television, where we have more time to talk thoughtfully about some of these things, we do from time to time run out. I'm afraid we have for this particular segment. We have to hold over for another program of discussion as we get up into the uh, closer to the presidential election. But I certainly thank you for all of those observations in terms of the uh, the, the current economic situation. I certainly thank you for participating here in the conversation. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. And for all of your work over the years. It's a great pleasure to have met you. And it's been a pleasure for you in the cable television audience to have had the perceptions in of uh, Louis Neiser, then, uh, our leading uh, representative of the, uh, jury of the uh, law, legal profession and a, a philosophical voice you've been able to see in great import here in the United States. Happy to be able to bring you those perceptions. And we here on Conversations would like to invite you to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back next week. Mr. Neiser, once again, thank you very, very much indeed for participating. Good night. See you next week.